Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Winship. I am a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute and director of the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility. Uh, we created COSM uh, in part to encourage conservatives to prioritize upward mobility in social poverty. Economic poverty, including child poverty, has never been lower thanks to a combination of economic growth and a safety net incompletely reformed to promote work. Middle class in incomes are higher than ever. Too many populists on the left and right today mistakenly believe that the economy has ceased to be an engine of prosperity for most Americans. But at the same time, we've made little progress increasing intergenerational mobility from the bottom to the middle class. And in fact, that may have much to do with the parts of the safety net that we haven't reformed. A strong economy will leave many people behind if they enter adulthood unprepared to benefit from it. Moreover, on a variety of dimensions, social capital has deteriorated, increasing what we call social poverty. The social breakdown has hurt lower income Americans most of all, adding to and strongly contributing to the problem of intergenerational immobility. COSM seeks to develop a conservative policy agenda to expand opportunity, economic and social. And so we're happy today to host a presentation and conversation by two veterans of President Trump's administration who toiled away tirelessly behind the scenes to meaning, meaningfully help the vulnerable populations about which COSM cares most. Jerron Smith and Chris Pilkerton describe their efforts and provide a plan of action moving forward in their new book, Underserved, Harnessing the Principles of Lincoln's Vision for Reconstruction for Today's Forgotten Communities. We'll hear a presentation from them, and then I'll uh, uh, pop back in for a conversation uh, with Jerron and Chris. But first, uh, let me introduce uh, our guests. Jerron Smith is a partner at Denton's Global Advisors and senior fellow for Right on Crime. Jerron served in several roles at the White House, including Deputy Assistant to the President for Domestic Policy, Deputy Director for the Office of American Innovation, and Director of Urban Affairs and Revitalization for the White House Domestic Policy Council. During that time, his work included leading the legislative effort around criminal justice reform and the First Step Act, authoring executive orders and other impactful initiatives on issues related to safe policing and access to capital for minority-owned businesses. He also served as chief, chief policy strategist for enactment of the Opportunity Zones provision in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Smith was a key negotiator in helping to secure permanent funding for HBCUs under the Future Act. Prior to his post at the White House, Jerron worked for Senator Tim Scott and served on the staff of the House Committee on Financial Services, the Republican Study Committee, the House Republican Conference under then Representative Mike Pence, and the Office of Representative J.C. Watts. He's the former Executive Director of the Thurgood Marshall Foundation Center for Advancing Opportunity. He holds a BBA from Howard University and a Master of Divinity from the Howard School of Divinity. And he's a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha. Chris Pilkerton is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and a former cabinet member and head of the US Small Business Administration, serving as both the agency's acting administrator and general counsel. In these roles, he advocated for America's millions of small businesses, advanced manufacturing ecosystems, and associated workforce development initiatives for urban and rural areas. He also served as a White House senior policy advisor and the executive director of the White House Opportunity Now Initiative, a government-wide program to support economic empowerment for disadvantaged communities, working directly with mayors and governors on local economic initiatives. Chris has worked as a legal, as chief legal and regulatory strategy officer for the nation's largest nonprofit community development financial institution, concentrating on small business support for the underserved, as well as a compliance director at J.P. Morgan Chase, where he was named one of the heroes of the Fortune 500 by Fortune Magazine for his humanitarian efforts in Liberia. He began his legal career as, as an assistant district attorney in Manhattan and went on to become senior counsel at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. He's been an executive in residence at John Hopkins University, the John Hopkins University, uh, Cary Business School, and Georgetown University. Uh, McDonough School of Business. Uh, he's been the Associate Director of the Law and Public Policy Program at the Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, and a Fulbright Teaching Scholar in Poland. He holds a Master's in Public Administration 
from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, a JD from, from uh, CUA, a BA from Fairfield University, and a certificate in data analytics from Cornell University College of Business. Uh, so I think Jaron and Chris are going to uh, co-present. Um, so with that introduction, I'll uh, leave it to you. Okay, just wanted to figure this out here. Um, <laughs> well, uh, for starters, thank you so much for having us. This is uh, fantastic to be here. Thank you all for being here live um, and for the folks online as well. Um, this really was a labor of love. I think Jaron would agree with that. Um, but more importantly, it really zeroes in on some of the, the key problems and initiatives that we see within government and outside of government um, with kind of the goal of figuring out from a public-private partnership perspective how can we advance these underserved communities that have been forgotten for so long. Um, and as you'll see through our presentation, we attempted to demonstrate that some of this goes all the way back to Reconstruction and what Lincoln's vision actually was. And we'll get into that uh, in a second, but John, any intro comments? Sure, it's just that this has been a, a full circle journey for Chris and I. Um, we got to get together and work on this book because of our life past. Um, in the book, we talk about our personal experiences and our personal faith journey that brought us together in the White House and how after leaving uh, the White House after the pandemic, uh, we realized there was so much work that still needed to be done. And so as a result of that, um, we took time to write this book, but we've also in our um, personal and private life continued to do the work. And so um, as we uh, talk more about what we think is an appropriate strategy we want you all to keep in mind um, that this is an ongoing talk. Um, and it was used to facilitate conversations um, that can bring uh, different people together to develop solutions that are sustainable for all Americans. And I should note that Nicole Frazier is here in the audience, who is <laughs> one of our colleagues in the White House that achieved a lot of this uh, alongside of us. So Nicole, thank you for being here. Uh, Kevin Corinth over there, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. What was Lincoln's vision for Reconstruction? When we do interviews, that's the first question we get. Like, how do we go from 2023 all the way back to 1865 and, and before? So what Lincoln wanted to achieve, uh, of course, after dealing with the inhumanity of slavery, was the idea of remaking opportunity for all. And I think a lot of this comes back to where Lincoln grew up, right? We've all heard the stories of Lincoln in the prairie and chopping his wood and then reading the same book a thousand times and then reading everything else he could possibly find and becoming self-educated. But what he saw was that that was a unique opportunity for a, a driven person. Um, he wanted more opportunity for all, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but in some of his early campaign speeches, he talked about the idea of this city of Huron. And it was sort of a port city, kind of like a New Orleans back in the day, where you had um, small businesses and tradespeople. And it's really kind of you know, exciting uh, economic ecosystem. Um, and that didn't exist outside of certain areas on, on the East Coast. And so what he wanted to achieve was really expanding that, not just through what could be done post-slavery, but also extending it out west. Um, and in fact, he created something called the Morrill Land Act, uh, which was the beginning of the state university system with the idea that you know, some of the schools that were already in existence were more about philosophy and not practicality, um, and so that people could get vocations and really kind of you know, build out uh, employment opportunities, but, but also small businesses. Um, and as you see in the quote here, really was about lifting the, the artificial weights from, from shoulders and clearing that path uh, for folks to be able to work and toil and achieve the results uh, of what they wanted. Uh, you'll see a little bit of a timeline here. Um, technically, Reconstruction went to 1877. Obviously, President Lincoln didn't have uh, the opportunity to see any of that um, being assassinated in April of 1865. Um, but as we talk about in the book, 
you have you know, Andrew Johnson that came in. Um, and as many people know, he was not only an accidental president, um, but he was flawed in a whole host of different ways, um, not the least of which was his ability to really figure out the direction for the country. Um, and he also didn't have the political capability of achieving anything other than essentially ending uh, the Civil War and, um, or continuing the, you know, the end of the Civil War and then Reconstruction. Uh, and then obviously um, President Grant came in and President Grant did a number of, of great things, um, as we all know, but by the time he came in, we discussed this in the book, he was faced with such a set of challenges on the racial front, he didn't even have the, the ability to focus on sort of the opportunity agenda that, that Lincoln had in mind. Yeah, and, I, and that's, I think that's key because that opportunity agenda, what we like to talk about in the title, um, is this vision of economic empowerment, um, which we think gets less to, left out in this conversation. What, why does markets, why do they make sense um, to dealing with the challenges of underserved people? Um, we think that in Lincoln's original vision, um, he looked at markets and the, uh, the ability for people to be economically empowered was a key ingredient um, to allowing for success um, amongst not only the underserved, but the different races. He was looking at underserved whites as, a, as well as underserved blacks. Um, we think fundamentally, um, if that type of action happened, um, we would have more of a coming together um, as people um, uh, worked through their eco economic blights to kind of achieve from a human point of view. Instead, what we saw um, out of the Johnson um, administration was um, a reinforcement um, of, of the Southern um, leadership class where he was able to give them back their um, properties um, and they were able to kind of create um, a new regime that we know as Jim Crow. Um, and that set back um, Reconstruction. So by the time um, Grant c came in um, with actual Reconstruction, um, it was too late. It had been organized in such a fashion you didn't really have um, that uh, undergirding um, to make sure that you know, uh, you know, there's no second-class citizens, but us as all Americans are also trying to pursue the American dream. You know, um, people also talk about 40 acres and a mule. Of course, we're in a, um, we had an industrial economy, um, but in the South, you still had um, uh, people working in agriculture. So it was important for you to be able to farm and, and, and create benefits off of that. Um, um, but instead, you got sharecropping. Um, and you, you had this whole um, issue around uh, the state creating these rules around even the electorate, um, which set back um, um, communities in the South um, for a generation. And so, um, but we thought about Lincoln's vision for reconstruction for today's forgotten community to have us return to this whole notion about economic prosperity and how do we create an American system that works for everyone um, and, and allows everyone to pursue the American dream. So I think Jaron just sort of laid out exactly what is that dilemma because as we all know, you know, there's things that have changed and there's a lot that hasn't. Um, there still are these communities that are forgotten. A lot of them get lip service. Um, we all know about the fights on the Hill back and forth for different programs, but a lot of times these communities are, you know, quite frankly, fighting for scraps. Um, and they're fighting for scraps in a way that just kind of continues the hamster wheel um, and doesn't take a step back and think about how do we empower folks and recognize that, you know, folks do need a, a hand up, um, but, you know, they need that help along the way. And if you don't, if you're not thoughtful about it, and, and John always uses the term intentionality, so if you're not intentional about it, um, then we're just going to keep doing things the same way that we've done it. And so it really translates into, into a market failure, right? It's something we've we've created ourselves. Um, when you think about you know, the financial crisis uh, back in 2008, there were people that you know, created that, that crisis you know, on, on the back of mortgage-backed securities, right? It was something that, that they did. Um, and this is something that we as a, as a country um, continue to do. And you can clearly see components of whether it's a bailout in the Great Recession or go back to the Great Depression there are a lot of components of that that, that continue today. 
and those programs haven't been rethought. Um, we continue to sort of get money into the programs, and um, I don't know, I'm going to probably go out of order here a little bit, but one of the programs that we're going to talk about later was something that John and I worked on uh, with Nicole called the Platinum Plan, and we literally sat in OMB with the economists finding dollars of old grant programs that just hadn't been spent. So, so the money's there, but if you don't use it in an efficient way to help communities rise up so they can then reach down and help those coming behind them, um, then we're just gonna kind of continue that, that hamster wheel. And I think the, the last quote here really is that uh, we have to dare to, to do our duty. Um, and so if we don't do it now, you know, when does it get done? Yeah, and then, I mean, this dilemma that we're dealing with with market failure um, isn't just about the government. Um, you look at civil society, which has become um, the anchor, um, or historically has been an anchor in America to kind of really be the safety net um, to lift people up. Um, but in the 19th century, um, they, they've created um, all of these different programs that created more dependence on the federal government, and it riddled away at civil society. Um, and, and as a result, when we look past the pandemic, it got even worse. Um, as you saw, churches get closed down and programs get closed down and nonprofits get closed down. And so, when we're, again, going back to this whole Lincoln vision of reconstruction, what can we do now, not only to undergird um, the proper role of government, but what could civil society look like? What does the private sector look like? Because as was mentioned by Scott at the very beginning of the presentation, we see a huge increase of um, impoverished children. Um, and so we're now living in a nation that individuals who have no choice in what they're born into, you know, if you're likely born into a poor community, um, the odds are that you're gonna grow up poor and that your children will grow up poor. And that's almost antithetical to the American experience. And part of that, because, but part of that reason why we need to kind of think about nuanced approaches, I'll specifically talk about civil societies, because what happens if the parents aren't there? What happened if the parents never got taught these core virtues um, around um, pursuit, pursuit of happiness and um, the resiliency it takes to achieve in America? You know, so what we need to do as leaders um, when we're coming up with solutions, um, account for all of these nuanced factors that make up impoverished communities, that make up underserved communities, and meet this moment where people are. I'm gonna let you take this one. Yeah. <laughs> so this this is why I think capitalism is is a great answer. Um, you will hear some of my friends on the left be back on capitalism by talking about how it exploits people. Like there's a winner and there's a loser. Um, they often use slavery and how it exploited people or child labor and things like that. Um, but we know that um, capitalism is meant to be mutually beneficial. You know, um, if if we're able to kind of talk about um, uh, both sides being educated and how they both can benefit, um, we can leverage capitalism to do all types of amazing things. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that, hey, you know, um, ESG is the way to go, because we look at that as kind of mandates on um, communities. What we're talking about is real mutual benefit. Um, there are things that private organizations could do um, that helps their shareholders um, help make profit, but also do good things for society. Um, and help move society forward. Uh, almost any big corporate institution does a lot when they hire people and create jobs. You know, jobs um, are an anchor that has historically lifted people up from poverty, especially if they're allowed um, to, you know, earn a good living. They can take that good living and maybe transfer that into a job. Um, that's what we learned from Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass worked at a um, manufacturing plant, um, saved, um, created a newspaper, and then the rest was history for him. He became a um, huge abolitionist, um, but also was able to um, empower himself economically. You know, um, to do such a thing today is almost unheard of because um, one, uh, we put so many regulations on businesses, it's hard for them to kind of give people the type of salary that they want. Um, two, it's hard to kind of uh, um, incentivize the right jobs to go to the right locations. Um, and then three, um, through the regulatory state, it's hard for a person to save, you know, um, um, let alone get a loan from a bank. Um, in order to start a bank, um, start a business. And so um, all of these barriers we've seen um, come across um, um, throughout the years have brought, has brought us to this moment of, of a real dilemma. 
but a dilemma that we can fix um, by creating a paradigm that will talk about the mutual benefit of capitalism. Um, because many people really don't know that. You know, they don't get taught that in universities. They don't get taught that um, certainly on, on, on the news. Um, most of the, the channels you go to, they're always talking about how companies are exploiting and how the private sector is so wrong. Um, but there's a lot that the private sector has done and will continue to do to help create economic prosperity. Um, and that's what we hit on in the book, that mutual benefit, that mutuality of capitalism. Um, that story needs to be told. Um, and and part, part of the reason it needs to be told because we see it as the strongest, strongest strategy with lifting up underserved communities. So one of the questions that we get when we talk about this is, you know, have you talked to conservatives about this? And we've had, I can't tell you how many conversations, because obviously a lot of our friends and coworkers and colleagues are, are, are conservatives. And people, you know, sometimes use that word conservative, and they say, well, I'm a conservative. And what we wanted to do was kind of go back through history and say, look, if you say you're a conservative, then let's see, you know, let's kind of put it all out there and look back at what are the conservative economists, conservative philosophers, the folks that kind of help shape our American democracy, what did they say? And what did they say particularly about underserved communities? Because you hear folks say that I'm a conservative and people have to lift themselves up by their bootstraps. So what we wanted to do was go back through history and identify what some of the conservative philosophers said, particularly the ones who you know, are kind of the, the, the nameplates that everybody knows, right? Um, so when you look at all of these philosophers, and I won't read all of these quotes, but I'm sure everyone recognizes the names, um, except when we started to do our research and we started looking at Hamilton and found a lot of information about theater and plays, so finally we got to some, <laughs> some content. Um, but, but really, it was about the fact that underserved communities are part of the conservative economic philosophy. Um, the problem that all of these philosophers had to a person is that it's the idea that if you continue to kind of throw money at a problem without a goal, without a data-driven solution, that's where you're going to get caught up in, in the issue. And they, they certainly don't support those. So I, I, the, the phrase from Edmund Burke that I love is the second quote there, hypocrisy can afford to be magnificent and its promises for never intending to go beyond its promises. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we're competing against and one of the ideas that we fundamentally are trying to demonstrate that there's, there's a response to. Um, you know, if you look at this, obviously it goes chronologically and you look at you know, Milton Friedman and, and obviously Jack Kemp, and, and we were able to interview um, uh, Congressman Kemp's son, Jimmy, in the book, which was, which was wonderful. Um, but you know, Milton Friedman, um, well, I'll go with Hayek. What politician can possibly care about long run effects if in the short run he buys support, right? So a lot of politicians, particularly on, uh, on the left, aren't thinking about sort of the long run. Um, and that's really important. The quote from Friedman, which isn't here, which is something that we talk about quite a bit, um, is that, that government doesn't know how to do things. People know how to do things. And so it's important that we as people, that we as folks that really care about these issues, step forward and bring it to the forefront and demonstrate a real plan. Um, because we mentioned this in the opening, there's a lot of lip service in this space. There's a lot of people talking about how awful it is, how bad it is, somebody should do something. Well, just like Reconstruction, now's our time and, and now's our opportunity. And that's grounded in what these conservative philosophers really preached. Yeah, and that, a lot of these uh, philosophers um, I learned about more so after college um, working on the Hill. You know, I was very curious about figuring out solutions for underserved communities. Um, I always wanted to figure out how I could best um, be of service to contribute to change. Um, and when I went on this um, voyage, this journey, um, I had a, a policy director at the time, well, the staff system named Russ Volk, and he had me read all of these Milton Friedman books. He had me read all of these Thomas Sowell books and, and um, Frederick Hayek. Um, and it really opened my mind. These are things that you never really um, learned. 
um, in grade school when it comes to philosophers that undergird the um, conservative movement, um, which is why um, we thought it was important to be able to uh, um, undergird our philosophy on change with the conservative philosophers that we've all read um, to kind of give um, some, some backing to um, the strategy that we, we're, we're recommending. Um, I, we also, as I, I spoke a little bit earlier, um, talked about having a nuanced strategy that goes beyond um, just the government. Um, one of the greatest things, or, or that, the things that I, I think was one of the best things that me and Chris worked on in the administration um, was creating the White House um, Opportunity and Revitalization Council. Um, through the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council, we was able to combine uh, um, the resources from 18 different agencies um, for underserved communities. And we focused those resources on four buckets, um, entrepreneurship, uh, economic development, uh, safe communities, and education and workforce. And from uh, uh, having this exercise of figuring out um, how these different agencies can work together, um, it helped later on uh, be like a, a, a guiding light towards why we think we needed to write a book because it was almost impossible to have these federal agencies work together um, just statutorily. Um, we would have to look at reform. Um, and then you'll see later in our presentation how we came to the conclusion of um, some of the reform ideas that we came up with. Um, but in working through these working groups, it gave us the ability to go on the road um, and go into communities. Um, the, the thought process was what we can work with civil society, um, federal, state, and local government, and then the individuals that benefited and create a partnership um, that would be um, public and private. Because the thought process was what, if we had the federal government, the state government, and the local government maybe working more together, you, can, you, you will create more room for the private sector to figure out where they can scale and, and nuance. Because right now what we see is that all of them are working independently of each other. Um, and all the money is going out the door with no outcomes. Um, and the people who kind of need that infrastructure for opportunity never get access to it. And so um, what we're about to go into now is sort of what those individual strategies look like. Um, but this did come out of a, um, a tested strategy that we had. And as a result, um, we wanted to make some recommendations that we'll talk about later in the presentation. So certainly want to be mindful of time, but these are just a few of the examples um, that, that Jaron's talking about. So workforce development, obviously a huge area for us. Uh, Pledge of the American Worker, you all may remember this. 16 million jobs were identified by a program where President Trump and the administration brought all of these you know, large CEO companies, or CEOs of these large companies together. And these identified positions were not only you know, good paying jobs, but there was associated skills training with them. And that didn't cost the taxpayer a dollar. It was just using the convening power of, of the White House and, and the mission that, that Jaron's talking about, the private sector mission that we need to incorporate into anything that, that we do. Um, I mentioned the Moral Land Act before, but this really ties back to what Lincoln wanted to, to achieve. But I think that's, there was a lot of workforce activity that was done. I know Jaron did a lot at the White House. We did a lot when I was in the Small Business Administration. Um, but that's going to be a, a critical component of what our, our plan is. You go to the next slide? Yeah, you can go on. Yeah, and so um, this also speaks to our historic investment into HBCUs, um, institutions that were going through some financial talent challenges. Um, but the other side of it was we weren't just looking at uh, cash infusion from the federal government with these historically black colleges and universities. We were looking at ways to form those private-public partnerships. Um, as many um, um, of today's uh, major businesses go to these HBCUs to hire talent. And so um, them being able to um, work with private sector entities to um, regionally um, be competitive and also produce the best, um, we did a lot of convenings that helped bring uh, those two partners together. And I think um, if Trump was able to do a second term um, after that, we would have saw um, more of a merging between this initi initiative on Council of the American Worker and HBCUs, as well as other um, predominantly serving institutions, um, such as community colleges, also historically Hispanic um, institutions. Because when we saw that HBCUs were just like a test case, because as you can see, 
Um, you know, when it comes to education, you know, Afri African Americans have been at the lower tier of um, um, product productivity as it relates to um, educational scores and things. So our, our thought process is that we, if we can work with those historically institutions, historically black institutions, to create new infrastructure um, that was more sustainable, made them less sustainable on government, um, more more sustainable on like outcomes and, and, and students that they're um, producing, um, we can also do that in other underserved um, institutions throughout America. Um, and, and what we saw um, has been fantastic. Uh, without us even having a second administration, there's been a huge amount of private sector invest in, investment into HBCUs. Um, and that's they, they've continued to grow, um, but it's been based off of some of President Trump's leadership and actually creating a platform to talk about the significance of these schools. No, I was just going to say, you know, another strategy we worked on economic development through Opportunity Zones. We mentioned the White House Opportunity Revitalization Council. That was mostly federal resources, but we leveraged Opportunity Zones to, 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 to target federal resources into areas we knew that we would get private sector investment. And since um, the passage of the Opportunity Zone legislation, we've seen about $50 billion of new capital and to underserve um, areas all throughout, over 3,000 different underserved areas throughout the country. Um, but there still is more work to be done because we learned a lot about what Opportunity Zones were, was missing. Um, one dynamic was the political dynamic, obviously, um, that pushed a lot of um, would-be mayors um, from major metropolitans that should have worked with our administration because of the politics of it being a Trump initiative. Um, and so that's something that we need to work on in society. Um, we also talk about that in the book, that these issues of underserved should be nonpartisan. Um, these should be issues that all of us could agree upon and bring different ideas and different strategies to, to the table and have that debate. You know, but politics has gotten in the way. Um, but in, in order to kind of get there, you know, um, we're, we're suggesting that we take politics out of it um, and kind of create a bipartisan infrastructure that can help bring more um, um, left and right alliances together. Um, but we want to undergird the solutions into being free market because we think in them being free market, they're more sustainable and less dependent on the government. Um, and before you get into all of this stuff, you know, not to hide the elephant in the room, you know, to get economic development, to get access to education, you know, um, many of these um, depend on communities being safe and having safe communities. And so we ran a whole campaign on um, how do we reform our federal um, justice systems in a way that creates more public safety. Um, and we had a, um, a slogan called being smart on crime. So it's, the, it's different than being soft or strong. It's kind of actually being strong by being smart. Um, and you do that by um, studying the data analytics, which we know 95% of individuals are coming home from prison. Um, what are we doing about that 95% that come home? We know that that 95% come home, especially in the states, 80% of them are likely to go back to prison. And so if we're able to put resources into the federal prisons or into the prisons itself to reform or, or, or look at the reasons why a person went to prison in the first place, we can lower those recidivism rates and, and, and in time also um, lower um, crime um, and, and, and have the police and all those individuals focus on, um, focus on those most violent offenders and not having to worry about those nonviolent offenders. Because in many cases, and this, these things are all holistic. Um, that's why you see the strategy. These things feed in together. You know, there's been failure um, in the education system. There's been failure um, in how some of these individuals grown up. Um, there's been mental health issues um, that people get arrested for um, that's never been diagnosed. And then there's also been poverty issues um, that relate to why people are turning to crime as a, re as a result of it. And so um, this is why we kind of ended with this piece insofar as the strategies, um, but they all kind of fold in with each other. Um, and with the White House Opportunity Revitalization Council, what we were doing, we're, we're trying to localize this issue and not take a top-down approach, but being flexible federal-wise to take a bottom-up approach that's going to be very organic to the community. Because in some underserved communities, it may be crime. and others, it may just be economic development. and others, it may be um, lack of business or lack of education. And so what we want to do as partners is figuring out how do we get there, and then what are the assets, what are the private sector assets on the ground that we can set up an infrastructure for opportunity for those communities? And so we talked a bit about the uh, White House Opportunity Revitalization Council. We also had something called the Platinum Plan, um, which really was a focused, committed dollar figure, um, as you can see here. 
uh, for the African American community. Uh, and really, I think part of that was looking once again holistically at what what Jaron was talking about, not just about some of the social issues, um, but the economic issues. And that's really at at the core. Um, in our book, uh, the artist Ice Cube was kind enough to do the foreword. And that's really where, where his focus is, particularly around the black community. Um, and so we were able to work with him a little bit on the Platinum Plan, and we continue to work uh, with him today. Um, so I'd like to just, given kind of the time where we are, maybe talk about, we have all these great ideas, right? You're like, oh, it's fantastic. How are you actually going to put it together? This is how we, we, we put it together. Um, it's called the tuck, kind of rolls off the tongue, right? The czar for underserved communities. And the idea is that we do a Marshall Plan. You know, we, we've done this over in Europe, um, and now it's time to do it for the US and really figure out how do we help these underserved communities. And I alluded to the story about we were literally combing through OMB's budgets, but that was during the middle of the pandemic on a very specific deadline. It's time for Congress in a bipartisan way to get together with a open, transparent handshake um, and say, look, we're gonna stop the hamster wheel and we're gonna actually work together. And so the idea is to have the czar, the czar would be sort of a long-term appointee, kind of like an FBI director, so you minimize the political interaction, although I recognize that politics are always gonna be at play. And you bringing some of these specific areas that are particular to underserved communities. And you may say, well, how can you actually do that? These programs are interspersed throughout these agencies and there's different you know, deputy assistant secretaries of such and such or what have you. That's the whole idea, right? Like these programs don't even necessarily know that they should be working together. And the example of the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council was the, the perfect one because you had cabinet members who were responsible for the president having a conversation across the table saying, wait, you've got that program, we've got this workforce program, why don't we get rid of mine or have it be more you know, impactful working with yours? And those conversations literally took place. Um, so it's time for, for this audit. Um, and at the end of this process, you know, we're not trying to create a new government agency, we're certainly not trying to create a new government position um, in the long term, but it would sunset. And it would sunset based on, on outcomes. And if you're looking at kind of the economic equation of this, the variables that I think we would put into it are uh, intentionality, trust, collaboration, outcomes, and data collection. And that's that cycle and circle that, that Jaron was talking about that really can be applied to, to any problem. So there's a lot of information on this next slide, um, but Jaron, if you wanna talk a little bit about the equation and the components. So this methodology is just what um, an organization like the Trump administration we use to create trust. Um, as you can imagine, um, history always would read the Trump administration as being very polarized, um, but all of the things that um, uh, we've talked about today have been very bipartisan in, in, in essence. Um, but how do we create that bipartisanship? Um, it was about being intentional um, and building trust with different partners from us on the other side of the aisle. And once we had that trust, we were able to co um, collaborate and develop outcomes. Um, and almost all the outcomes that we um, put out there, we, we, we put up data collection to continually to study um, if it worked or not. Um, because we have to be relentless with this work because um, America's most important asset is, it, is its people. Um, and if we don't invest um, in our people um, through civil society or um, um, federally or, or, or um, you know, as a country, um, we, we risk the chance of not having um, what we have, you know, which is, which is the country we have. I mean, you've seen um, on both the right and the left, you know, um, different outcries um, through, you know, um, riots, you know, um, and protests. Um, and, and, and we think that undergirds that, 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 that core of people being upset um, is this, this lack of um, economic prosperity um, for, for everyone. Um, and people feel like their leaders have failed them. Um, and so we think that um, this work is extremely important. And we know that the word czar may give, especially conservatives, <laughs> a lot of pause, um, as well as um, thinking about a, a, an agency. Um, but again, this is a conversation starter. Um, we need to think outside the box. Um, and we, we use language so it can be pithy to have you think about bigger solutions than what we've had. 
Um, and there's a way that we can go about it. And it may not just be the federal government doing it. You know, um, this may be something that the private sector organizes on its own, which I would love. I mean, that's the work mm -hmm. that me and Chris are doing in our in our everyday lives. Um, but um, I think we can um, kick it over um, to Scott and go over some questions. Can I use this last slide? I just, sure. I just, yeah, this is something that I always like to end with because it is hopeful and General Howard, um, who helped start Howard University, was the head of the Freedmen's Bureau. And, you know, imagine being this person. Okay, Civil War's over. Now figure it all out um, for, for these freedmen. Um, and that's essentially, that was his job, to do that. And Johnson, you know, really hamstrung him in a lot of different ways and tried to get rid of him and all these kinds of things. Um, but really... This last quote has always just stuck with me, um, and not to bury the lead, but this is the last line of the book. Um, so work then, my friends, while the sun, sh sun shines, do what government cannot do. What we're talking about here obviously has a very significant government component, but as Jaron has articulated, this really is a private sector driven plan um, where government can, can help, um, um, but, you know, for the most part, kind of gets out of the way to allow uh, economic opportunity to happen in a, a truly capitalistic way. So with that, thank you for letting me say that. I just really, I learned a lot about, we, we learned a lot about General Howard, and he really is one of the, I think, unknown heroes of, of Reconstruction. Well, thank you uh, to both of you for uh, that, that great presentation. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll lead a conversation here for a bit and we'll have time at the end uh, for some questions from the audience as well. Uh, first, I was just interested, how did the two of you become interested in opportunity, a little bit about your backgrounds um, and how'd you come to write a book together? Sure, well, uh, the one thing we mentioned in the book is just our um, shared personal experience. You know, um, I was um, blessed to go to a Catholic school, even though I've never been a Catholic. Um, my father uh, thought education was important, and so um, he invested in my education, and uh, um, he can afford to send me to Catholic school. Um, and it was from that experience in Catholic school that I learned about um, the transcendentalist and individual empowerment. Um, and so when I came to Washington, D.C., you know, um, uh, though I was looking to play football and maybe start a bank one day, um, I wanted to do something to empower my community. And obviously moving to Washington, D.C., you get hit with the political bug pretty easily. And I think when I moved out here, uh, it was the Bush-Gore election, um, my freshman year of college, and I just got all into it. Um, and um, from having that North Star to wanting to do change, once I interned and once I got opportunity, um, this became like a pet project um, that allowed for me to meet folks like Ryan and other people on the Hill, like Scott, um, as we all tried to kind of um, achieve, you know, um, ideas of like, how do we revitalize the system? Um, and that's how I met Chris. Um, Chris was just as hungry um, for doing this type of work. And um, when we were able to find, um, uh, to sign the White House Opportunity Revitalization Council um, into an executive order, that's how I met Chris. And uh, we've kind of been tied at the hip almost since. Yeah, he pretty much summed it up as far as, as, as how we met. Um, and, you know, he, John, um, I give him so much credit for so many of these things that, that we've talked about that, that, that he's led and his passion really is, an infe is infectious. So when I was uh, growing up, I grew up in the D.C. area, I went to Gonzaga High School just down the block. So the Jesuit kind of folks kind of got the message to me early. Um, and that's really just sort of stayed with me. Um, and you know, men and women for others. And it, it's something that is, I think, really powerful. Um, and when you get to government, um, as I did at the SBA, I think that's, that's what you're there for, right? It really is public service. You know, it's not meant to be a 30-year job or a 40-year job. It's about taking that passion, that capability, that understanding that you have from the private sector um, and, and really, really applying it. Um, and so when I, and I was their general counsel, and usually the uh, policy coordinating committees that I'm sure a lot of you know what those are, those are the, the uh, meetings that happen right after an executive order is signed to kind of bring together all the different agencies. 
at the table. And uh, as their general counsel, there's no lawyers in the room usually. It's the White House lawyers. Nobody wants the other lawyers kind of mucking it up. Um, but that's when I first met Jaron, and he was leading it. And I was like, I got to get to know this guy. Um, and then I think I made the mistake of getting to know him in the middle of uh, while the first step back negotiations were going on. Because I don't know if I've ever told you this, but we were sitting at, I was sitting at a cozy, and I think I got there like 20 minutes early, and he was 10 minutes late. So I was sitting there for like half an hour just waiting for this guy. Um, and I, and, but literally, he was like, I'm so sorry. I was in the middle of doing something on, on legislation. I didn't realize that, you know, the, the importance of what he was doing. Um, and that just, you know, continued. And I was just sort of blown away. So by the time I got to the White House after I left the SBA um, in, in March of 2020, you know, he was dialed in and uh, was just able to kind of follow his lead. And then we had the, the great opportunity to work on so many things together. We, um, t we didn't really talk about this, but the um, policing reform executive order back in June of 2020 um, was one of those things that we worked on, you know, nonstop because the uh, Congress couldn't get legislation done. And the only option the president had was to write an executive order. And I tell people that that executive order um, stood, and then it was rescinded in the beginning of the Biden administration. And about two years later, they basically just put together the exact same executive order, because it was, which you know, it was comprehensive, right? I mean, it addressed not just the policing reform, but mental health reforms for police officers to, you know, help get access uh, to their homeless, drug addicted people, social workers. Um, and once again, we had economic ties to uh, the implementation of federal dollars. So I think there's 18,000 police precincts, and overnight, just by signing it, 3,000 precincts automatically uh, became tied to it. So these were solutions that we were working on and got the chance to work on together. I'm, I'm glad for your response because I think that I was also stuck waiting for Jerron in that very same coast. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spot. <laughs> it's got a plaque there on the. That's that right. Yeah, had his own table, <laughs> the Jerron Smith table. Um, uh, so next question, and I'm sure you'll be able to guess uh, what question number three is going to be. Uh, wanted to give you guys an opportunity to say what you think conservatives and Republicans uh, get right and wrong uh, when it comes to uh, thinking about opportunity and policy to promote opportunity. Well, one thing we talk about in the book is this whole notion of um, rugged individualism. You know, um, I, I'm a person who believes in individualism. Um, however, uh, when you look at where some people are positioned in life, um, you know, some odds are stacked up against them. Um, there is a, a way to achieve. You know, um, I worked on many of years with Bob Woodson, who would um, uh, he's made his career about going into these communities where um, um, the opportunity barriers were, were rattled against people, but they still had individuals that were able to achieve um, despite that. But there still was some, some, some anchoring. Um, in many cases, it's the family. Um, in other cases, it's a mentor. Um, in other cases, you know, um, it's a school teacher or a coach, you know, um, which kind of um, bangs at the notion around um, just rugged individualism. You know, I think the true story of, of people is that we're somewhat interdependent on e each other with like learning. Um, but and, and what I've also come across is a lot of individuals that have been so traumatized um, that it's really no coming back. You know, I'm talking about um, kids that grow up with um, drug abuse, um, with um, sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, you know, um, and, and, and many times it's hard to be as resilient um, with that. And so when we're talking about this, um, infrastructure of opportunity is just putting more light to what individualism could look like and how we can kind of um, uh, re-equip um, American citizens um, with the infrastructure through civil society that helps make more resilient people. Um, because, I mean, look, I mean, I've even had my own trauma story that I've had growing up. However, um, the, the infrastructure I had through family um, allowed for me to make mistakes and then get back up, you know, um, and then getting back up every time um, I, I got to an opportunity to kind of serve um, in Congress and then serve in a White House, you know, but I was no, by no means perfect. Um, and that's the, the true reality of um, any success story is being able to survive those challenges. And so um, we just wanted to put a finer point on 
on um, the thought around the American experience that is not just um, rugged individualism. Um, I think conservatives do get it right when they talk about the promise of markets um, and, and the theory of mutuality. Um, I just think we need to talk about what mutual, mutuality means and um, why capitalism has done so much to solve for impoverished communities and what it looks like, what's the, what's the possibility of it. Um, and part of that is showing up um, in the communities that are underserved. Um, that's one thing I'm thankful to be a part of the Trump administration is that he, through some of his policy, kind of reasserted um, Republican leaders as now being a um, party for the middle class and for the lower 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 class individuals that like you know we all can achieve and that's what undergirds um, what he what he, what he would describe as the America First policy. Yeah, I, I'd agree with everything that that Jerome was just saying. Um, I think specifically one of the things that that was really clear to us in writing the book was knowing the history of conservatives, right? Knowing what does that actually mean? Um, because that's a word that can be used and defined and redefined and what have you, but, you know, but a word that has no meaning has no meaning. So if you look at what these philosophers talk about, particularly on the topic of underserved communities, that's why we were very intentional about outlining all of that, um, so that when folks do use that phrase, you know, I'm a conservative, you can point back to that because if you can work from that agreed upon foundation, then we believe the plan that we put forward makes sense because while it does, once again, have that government component, um, it's a private sector driven approach. It's great. Yeah, the, the focus on uh, trauma, I think, is a, is a really insightful inclusion in, in the book. Um, called to mind the, uh, the this sort of a burgeoning research focus on adverse childhood experiences um, and just how important those are for, uh, for affecting kids as well. Um, all right, next question is what uh, do liberals and uh, Democrats get right and wrong when it comes to uh, opportunity? You guys uh, are, are pretty, uh, have, some, have some pretty harsh words for, uh, for some, some liberals in the book in terms of motivation. Um, so what, what would you say uh, would be the, uh, the strength of weaknesses? Well, I would say that um, both sides, the whole kind of using um, impoverished communities for political points, Republicans have done that too, so I'll be honest there. But I, I will say um, with the left, you know, since we we did um, the, the New Deal and the Great Society programs, there's this overabundance um, push to centralize control or um, to use government as a solution, you know, um, but one thing they've done well is actually going into the communities that are impoverished and at least creating that trust with them. Um, although I don't agree with their solutions all the time, um, I do admire some of the trust that they have. Um, and, that, and gaining that trust is important. I mean, on many of the reforms that we talked about, um, rather it's the first step back with working with Van Jones or Cory Booker on, on Opportunity Zones um, or Bob Johnson, um, as, as we was kind of working on uh, solutions to the PPP program and things like that. Um, or someone like Ice Cube, who's not, he, he's not the most conservative person, you know, um, <laughs> if you had to ask him. I mean, we read his plan, uh, which wasn't really that conservative, um, but he has trust for the community. Um, he also had areas where we said, hey, look, this may be some areas of common ground. Um, I think all four of them um, had so much passion for changing the, the, the status quo, that they were willing to work with us. Um, and so um, folks on the left, on the right, need to be more open to that because it's really not about them and their personal philosophies or my personal philosophies or Chris's personal philosophies. It's what we can do to achieve um, solutions that can make America a better place. Um, and that type of debate is healthy. I think that and this goes to the idea behind um, this approach that we're taking, this, this tuck. It's that every policy just becomes one more piece of government. And without kind of getting rid of the policy that it's actually supposed to get rid of. Because a lot of times, you know, that agency is still there, that funding is still there. And so it turns into this kind of, you know, Frankenstein behemoth. Um, where you're really not able to kind of strip it away. Uh, one of the ways that we tried to do this, you know, obviously outside of underserved communities as well, 
was the president's approach in deregulation um, and really trying to take a look at, I think originally it was for every new regulation, two had to be removed. And ultimately, I think the number was, you know, for every new regulation, eight were removed. And even at the SBA, we got rid of 10% of the regulations just because they weren't applicable anymore, or they were duplicative, or, or what have you. Um, so I think unless we take an approach that really does that audit, um, and I think the Republicans are responsible for that, obviously to a certain extent too, um, then it will just keep government will just keep growing and growing and growing. I want to come back to the uh, the, the question of trust in a moment, um, but first wanted to ask. So obviously, in the 19th century, federal government. Uh, had a tiny role uh, versus versus its role today. Although I, th I think the Civil War actually expanded the federal role fairly significantly in the in the years afterwards. Um, what do you see as as the inappropriate and appropriate roles for the federal government to take in trying to alleviate uh, poverty and expand opportunity? Um, can you say more about uh, kind of what what the federal government is doing? Um, in terms of trying to uh, facilitate the, the sort of private sector solutions that you're talking about? Sure, I, I always worry about the perverse incentives that have created um, through policy and, and through, through law. Um, if you look at uh, the current um, uh, welfare system um, that discourages marriage, um, I think in principle, um, people thought maybe going into the 70s that it was a good thing to give people an alternative that didn't want to stay in certain households. Um, but in practice, it did so much to kind of tear households apart um, and take fathers out of households. Um, and, and there's a number of different policy buckets that do that um, based off of um, income requirements. And so obviously, if you have a dual um, house income, that kind of makes you ineligible um, for certain resources. Um, but it also, um, conservatives try to do a lot of work in a bipartisan manner um, with Bill Clinton to also um, promote work. You know, um, I think one thing that we, two things that we have to worry about um, post the pandemic is uh, this whole notion of work. You know, there's so many jobs here, um, but then we started giving direct payments to individuals. And so it's, it's taken away that work ethic. Um, and at the same time, we haven't done anything to kind of deal with the uh, infrastructure around households, uh, which help, again, children become resilient and, and thinking about pathways for individuals who had very adverse experiences living in the pandemic when they had people uh, work from home. Um, and so I think that's what's undergird um, a lot of the crime um, and our solutions um, to it in some of our liberal cities have to create more magnets for more crime. Um, and so those perverse incentives, I think, is, is, is a real issue um, throughout our government, um, which is why me and um, Chris are really, really dialing out a strategy to get towards a more limited government. You know, um, doing the things through um, the czar is, is, is giving us a better platform to cut spending um, appropriately and also a better platform to talk about where the private sector should do some of that work so that we can have a more limited government. Um, I talk about in the book, about two, two different approaches. I had two different bosses, uh, one being Jim Jordan and another one being Steve Scalise. And uh, Scalise used to make the adage that like, you know, I'm all for um, throwing touchdowns but we can't throw Hail Marys on each play. You know, sometimes we just gotta work and move up the field and get some first downs. Um, and so that's what we're um, I'm speaking to more of a practical way uh, of getting towards the end zone, which is a more limited government. One of the things that I learned when I was at the White House was, and we've talked a bit about this, the convening power of the White House. And it really can't be understated. Um, you know, you, you, people will show up at the White House and they will show up for an event, they will show up for a party, they will show up for a helicopter landing, they'll show up for an Easter egg roll, right? But they will show up. And I think when you have them there, what are you going to do with it? Um, so you talk about the role of the White House, and obviously the White House does so many different things. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm just obviously kind of um, speaking tongue in cheek. But for example, when we talk about the Pledge for American Workers, those CEOs that were there had all of that infrastructure to create the apprenticeships and the reskilling associated with that. Um, now that took a lot of work to bring them all in the room, 
but this was back in you know, 2018, 2019, when you identify 16 million jobs and the White House and the agencies, the whole executive department, aren't spending a dollar to do that and help place those people, that's powerful. Um, so thinking about government that way, uh, I, I agree with you that obviously it did expand for, you know, in a lot of ways and, and for good reasons after the Civil War. But using that capability to bring the private sector in to reach the goals we're talking about, I think is really critical. Um, back to trust. Uh, so how can federal policymakers um, build trust in some of uh, the communities that we're talking about, and in particular, how can conservative policymakers build that trust where, uh, where perhaps there have been political periods where maybe there wasn't enough attention that was being uh, given to, uh, to certain communities, um, where there is a lot of wariness, you know, Ice Cube, I'm sure, uh, you know, given the choice of working with a Republican administration or a Democratic administration, you know, would probably gravitate towards uh, the latter. Um, how can policymakers and conservative policymakers in particular uh, build that, that sort of trust? Well, I think, first of all, showing up as in a non-election year is extremely important, you know, um, but more so what we talked about in the book is being intentional. You know, um, where are the areas where do you think there may be common ground? You know, um, uh, let's be specific about the policies and things that you want to champion. Um, and I think if you have that in mind, um, the trust building exercise is about really being able to listen um, to stakeholders and learning um, where you all have a, a, um, a shared goal in common. And then the trust is really built on how you collaborate. Um, and that, that those three, those first three met, um, parts of the methodology almost work together um, to, 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 to produce the outcome. Um, but um, the first step is kind of really knowing what change you're trying to see in the world. Um, because I think that in many cases, um, unless you're their politician, people have given up uh, on politicians um, overall. And people, all, everyone loves their local congressman for the most part. <laughs> Sometimes you don't um, if, if your guy didn't win um, or, your, or your lady didn't win. But uh, for the most part, um, you know, all politics is local. So um, being able to kind of meet people on where they are, um, but being very intentional about um, how do you want to engage um, and then taking the whole pol political piece out of it. You know, um, I can tell you that um, sometimes even their own representatives um, don't show up until election years. You know, um, some of the best um, members that I've met are consistent. They're always kind of meeting with their constituents. Um, and those are the people you see that um, have been in the Congress the longest. They've, they've kind of um, spent their time kind of working with their people. Um, but I think for conservatives, especially when you're looking at municipalities and areas where you don't see as much conservatism, um, is being able to show up, um, listen and learn, you know, um, and then have honest conversations. You know, once you have that trust, you can have that honest conversation. And then it's not, you don't have to be so guarded. Um, Cause that definitely happened with like Ice Cube, definitely happened with Van Jones. It's kind of just like, hold up, you know, can I tell you how I really feel about this policy? Um, but then act, actually we, we found out what we had in common and it was that shared goal. Then it became, well, if we're gonna do this and talk to my friends on the left, we should maybe talk about it this way. If we're gonna do this and we're gonna talk to my friends on the right, we should say it this way, you know, um, because they all, both want the same thing, but the messenger um, is extremely important because that trust element means everything. And, and public life. Real quickly, we were, uh, the program that um, had been started over the White House that I came over to work on was Opportunity Now. And before the pandemic, the idea was that we would go have these different events in different cities with both the federal government, but also the state and local government there as well. And so I think I, I agree 100% with what Jaron's talking about, about showing up. But to your earlier question about, that's another way the federal government, by showing the state government how to access the programs how to streamline things and then work with the local officials because we did calls with dozens and dozens of mayors because we weren't actually able to go there during the pandemic and we met with economic development officials and there were people that kind of you know knew what they were going to do but there were a lot of folks that just were deer in headlights right there were local business people that got elected and said great I'm mayor and all of a sudden you know history <laughs> gives you a pandemic what do you do right. um, so having that communication line I think is is really important um, we've got time for some questions, I think. Um, someone have a microphone. There we go. Tim's got the microphone. And if you don't have questions, I've got more. But 
I'm curious what you would speak to the community, the role of our faith communities in the church in helping to realize this vision as well. We've talked about private sector government. I'm curious if you can elaborate on that. I mean, honestly, that those institutions and those leaders um, were extremely important in almost everything we did from a policy perspective um, in the White House. Um, we had roundtables with faith leaders on opportunity zones, um, with issues around criminal justice, and they were our biggest um, advocates. Because, um, again, um, developing trust in the community doesn't always have to be um, necessarily me going in code. You know, um, sometimes it's me going in with a trusted advisor who sometimes is a, a faith leader um, that opens their doors like, look, I've developed trust with this person. Um, they're, they're working on X. You know, um, how can we um, figure out a partnership that makes sense? You know, um, and that's that's the experience I have. Um, and that's what I do a lot today. A lot of the work I do um, as a consultant is in civil society, you know, um, working with civil society and churches on public safety, working with civil societies and churches on um, closing the wealth gap um, or, or creating opportunity. Um, and they've been my number one um, partners with doing work around the underserved. Um, but I also um, put something on the, on, the, on the church too. Like, look, the church can't afford in this day and age to just be a social club. Um, we need the church's um, leadership to actually go out in the community, you know, and reach people where they are. Um, and sometimes reaching people where they are is not necessarily evangelizing, um, but being able to kind of meet them um, wherever they are in life and um, offering just the, the love in the heart of the church, um, will, will, which would help, you know, some people be more resilient because there's people who haven't received that love from anyone. And so these are things that a church could do that the government can't do, you know, meet people where they are um, with the heart that, that maybe undergird some resiliency and help give people hope um, to, to, to empower themselves. That to me was probably studying the black churches as part of this, the research for this book is probably the most fascinating part to me, just given the role the black churches have played during Reconstruction, not just about worship, but education, about political organization. Um, and you know, folks would walk, at least the research that I, we were doing, you know, 20 miles just to be part and participate in their democracy. Um, and they would participate in their democracy at, at, at the churches. Um, so that was just, you know, I would call Jaron, I'd be like, I just read this. And he'd be like, I, I know that. I was like, okay, well, I'm just learning, you know? So it was, it was amazing. I just, I just loved it. And, and obviously that translates into today as well. So to Jaron's point, you know, there is a history there. There is such a fabric there. And, you know, we as a country need to be able to tap into that, particularly um, with these communities that we're trying to help. Let me bring the mic over. Dr. Myrtle Alexander, Institute for Academic Management. Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I just love the history. Um, I do have a question regarding your platinum plan that you spoke of mm -hmm. to the tune of $500 billion mm -hmm. to inquire as to how you arrived at that number. And the reason I ask is, as an economist and looking at the history of America and where we are now with education, factoring in reparations to the tune of maybe seven trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. I just want to see where that decline of six point five billion six point five hundred billion dollars would be amiss to really get an ecosystem that is required to bring America to the level it needs to be. Sure. So when we were actually talking having this conversation with Ice Cube, um, that's that's sort of the thread that he was going into with um, having a reparations argument. Um, what we saw was um, looking at our financial institutions and their ability to deliver capital, we were able to kind of experience that firsthand um, while working on the PPP program. Um, we found that, um, what, that like 40% of African-American businesses um, could even access the programs from the PPP program. 60% um, were like underbank or unbanked and couldn't even really benefit from it. Um, and so um, we had a real dilemma around um, having a trust in banking relationships. Um, and then we also thought about the whole universe of banking relationships, um, like minority-owned banks or community development financial institutions. Um, and what we looked at was um, uh, funding that was already available through the Fed window. Um, and we realized with some of these institutions, because you got to understand that since Dodd-Frank, uh, many of the institutions have shrunk, um, and the regulatory regime 
has not allowed for them to be able to lend capital, especially if you're talking about micro grants, you know, um, uh, grants under um, or loans under 50,000. Um, and so what we looked at was how do we um, create more tier one capital um, for more banking institutions and incentivize more um, of the bigger banks to make in the fi financial investment um, uh, um, without bearing the loss because most big banks won't make loans under a million dollars because they don't it's not profitable for them um, and so what Chris and I um, discovered um, from doing all the work that we're doing that we can kind of meet ice cube maybe halfway um, and we did that by looking at the money that was available already that Congress already had available in the Fed window um, and if we were able to put 50 billion dollars out there the private sector could lever that up lever that up to half a trillion dollars um, um, because we wanted to create a test case um, for uh, figuring out an economic platform um, that can be leveraged. Another piece um, with that platinum plan was also um, stepping more into a mentor-protege model. Um, Bob Johnson had recommended to us that it's important that when receiving a loan that individuals know how to uh, make a profit off that loan. Um, he thought that the mentoring um, with so many small businesses is not there um, to teach them how to be profitable. So if you become, if you have a, um, if you get a loan and you have a salon, you get an extra chair, you know, um, how do you create that extra chair um, where you can kind of build revenue um, and be prosperous? And so um, within that whole dynamic around uh, um, half a, a trillion dollars was creating that infrastructure. Um, and that's something that Chris is still working on today with the small business core um, idea. But it's a notion of um, creating capital where we think there's been a, a market failure um, to undergird um, one of the most prosperous things in America, which is small business creation. Um, and then taking that small business creation to create jobs, because I think 90 percent of African-American owned firms are single person firms. Um, and so we think we thought through um, that paradigm shift that we can kind of uh, recoup through the private sector. Um, an economic engine that's more sustainable than just doing reparations, but kind of our version of what 40 acres and a mule would look like. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, I, um, I, I think John pretty much covered everything, but really the, the portion that you know, we focused on was that economic stimulus model. Um, as John mentioned, that access to capital was never more clear the lack of access to capital um, than during PPP. If you look at the numbers, um, and it wasn't because of the program necessarily, but it had a lot to do with the relationships that were pre-existing and a lot of the money um, that underserved communities, particularly the black community, didn't get access to and hadn't gotten access to. Um, and so we saw the platinum plan as both, you know, there was a lot of other components to it as well with respect to health care um, there was, you know, other criminal justice uh, plans that were associated with it, but at its core, and I spend my day job now working at a community development financial institution, it's about starting those businesses so they can grow, so they can hire, and then continue the sort of virtuous cycle that we've been talking about. So thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. I also wanted to note that on your tables for the folks who are here in the room, uh, there's a QR code you can scan to get the book, um, which I can recommend uh, to you all. Um, so last question in the back. Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you both for the excellent presentation. Um, I had one quick question and wanted to get both of your thoughts on the role that geographic mobility and brain drain from underserved communities plays in the long-term development of these communities, because it seems to me that we've seen a lot of the most highly educated people, the best trained people leave communities that, that need them most. So to what extent is this trend that we've seen somewhat the consequence of free choice and to what extent is it is it inevitable? Yeah, so this is something that is, is absolutely critical and this is where the solutions at the community level um, are, are so important. I'll give you an example. Um, some of the work that I was able to do at the Small Business Administration was working um, with uh, North Carolina State University. And in North Carolina, they have an incredibly strong community college system, a lot of which are in, in rural areas. And they were running into the exact same issue that, that you're talking about, right? Someone maybe goes to community college, matriculates up into the, 
to the state university and then finds themselves in you know, New York or Washington or Los Angeles or, or you know, somewhere else, or what have you. Um, they really concentrated on this through their educational system and created economic initiatives um, for folks that were coming through their system um, to start businesses and have sort of opportunities within, within North Carolina. And North Carolina is a really interesting place as well because when you think about the textile industry, a lot of it started there. Um, and so there's been a lot of, during the Trump administration, there was a lot of efforts to try to onshore a lot of that manufacturing. Um, and so we've talked about advanced manufacturing, and I know that's kind of a, a fun phrase to say, but it's really about, well, how do you then train those students into whether it's coding or software development associated with the uh, robotics around that. So I tell folks all the time that if, you know, opportunity zones are, and are something that can really work well if they're tied to what the community does well and what the community needs. Um, and so that brain drain that you're talking about, if there are opportunities for those folks there, um, it's certainly going to happen to a certain extent but it's less likely if they've got an opportunity where they are. Because at the end of the day, when you have that strong community, your family, your church, you, know, you may not want to leave it, or you may want to come back to it later on after you've gotten experience elsewhere. Yeah, just, just building off that, examples like uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, or Birmingham, um, they were able to kind of leverage um, the Opportunity Zone tool to kind of um, use it as a draw to keep people there. Because there's a number of factors why people move. You, know, um, you have jobs, you have affordability, issues you've seen um, post-pandemic. Some people leave like places like New York um, and move to places like Florida um, or Tennessee, you know, or places like Texas. Um, and I think that that's starting to play out now where there's the um, economic vi viability where you have affordability there and then jobs. And then you look at things if you have children like education. Um, but uh, to Chris's point, I think that um, part of the reason we wrote the book underserved is because we think that there needs to be nuanced solutions to look at the whole rubric of different communities, whether it's a rural community in Appalachia, you know, or the Mississippi Delta, you know, um, or a place like I came from, from Cleveland, which um, shrunk a whole lot um, since I left. Um, it used to be the biggest city in, in Cleveland. Um, now Columbus is, and it has been for over a decade. Um, but that comes with opportunity and being able to offer, um, offer something different to young people. Um, there to get them to stay. Um, but part of the reason we wrote the book is to encourage some of those nuanced solutions um, so that we can create that diversity um, throughout America that makes America competitive. Chris Pilkerton, Jaron Smith, uh, in the event of a second Trump administration, we will be fortunate to have folks like you uh, working to serve the underserved. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, our guests. Thank you.